<laughs> Thank you so much. Oh my God, it's so great to be here. It's great to see everybody. It's great to see you again, Simon. It's fancy skelly, a skeletor, as I call you sometimes. <laughs> as I'm commonly known. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when's the last time I saw you? I saw you at the end of March. We did a show in Denver together. Dink. Dink, Denver. It was their first year. It was fun. Yeah, it was all right. <laughs> had a, had a Sammy nice Harkham didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a nice time. Yeah, so um, welcome back to New York. I know we don't have you for very long here. Yeah, which flying out four in the morning for TCAF. Mm -hmm. to calf. <laughs> but yeah, heading up to Toronto tomorrow, such is the life of Simon Hanselman. Now you're just a jet setter. Mm, yeah, constantly traveling, constantly tired, <laughs> constantly wanting to die. <laughs> It's a good life. Um, so, so here we are in the Strand, which is uh, my favorite bookstore in New York City. I think it's probably one of the best bookstores in the world. I've only really been to New York and Pittsburgh um, and Denver, but I feel like I can safely say that. Uh, but, you know, Simon, I did a lot of research getting ready to talk to you. I, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I read a whole bunch of interviews. I listened to some podcasts. I got your social security number. I did a lot of stuff. And and the one thing I noticed that doesn't come up in your interviews is I, I don't know who you like to read. And I thought, you know, since we're here in the Strand, it might be a fun opportunity to talk about anything you like to read. Like, what's the last thing you read? The last thing I read? I don't know. I'm so high all the time. It's hard to remember. Um, I don't know. I like to read on the toilet. <laughs> Classic place. What, what do I what do I read, Grant? <laughs> <laughs> I like I like HTML flowers and stuff a lot. Um, oh yeah, all the box brown in the toilet. Um, Julia Gaffer, she's good. Look, I like last year I went to ten different countries and just had this relentless touring schedule. And this year I've had a bunch of friends die and it's been really fucked up. I'm like accumulating huge piles of books, but I'm not reading them. I, I just buy things, so this weird compulsion to buy shit and fill it, fill my house with shit. But uh, yeah, I feel like I'm not reading stuff anymore. I'm just focusing on my own work. And like me and Grant, my writing partner slash best friend, we're just sort of focused on our own shit. People ask me this, well, what, are you, what are you reading, what do you like? And it's just like, just me. I just <laughs> arrogantly like myself and what me and my friends are doing and everybody else can just fuck off. <laughs> well, um, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I, I like a lot you know, of when stuff. you're working, you're, you're isolated and so it's easy to make it just your own work in your own world. Mostly I just watch TV. What are you watching? Uh, again, I can't remember. I'm so stoned. <laughs> That's awful. I uh, new Silicon Valley's out. I'm watching Veep for the first time. That's pretty good. Yeah, Fargo was good. Um, Grant's got my back. Um, he knows what I like. Can we, can we get him a mic? Yeah. <laughs> Come and sit on my lap again, Grant, and we can get kicked out like in Sydney. Now, I should just quickly take a moment to apologize for not being fancied up and dressed up today because a lot of people expect that. And there was a bit, you know, I felt a bit of pressure, like, you know, come on, I bought my heels, I bought like six inch heels, I bought all my makeup, I bought a new eye pencil, but, you know, I ended up just hanging out with friends today and just like drinking beers and having a nice day in New York, so, uh, yeah, but I do apologize. I go to signings sometimes and people are like, you're not dressed up, I'm so disappointed, it's your whole identity, and it's like, come on, sometimes, Katie, Sp Katie Scaly looks fucking fabulous most of the time, but I'm sure sometimes, sometimes she's at home in some sweatpants and an old t-shirt, and that's what I'm doing today. Never. I'm just going casual, so I'm sorry about <laughs> that if you expected a glamorous sort of Priscilla, queen of the desert kind of, you know, <laughs> fantabulous, sparkle-tastic show, but you just, I'm just dressed like an asshole today. Now, let's... <laughs> well, I think you look great. Let's, uh, let's, let's take it back for a second. Now, when you, do, when you do feel inclined to dress, when you are, you know, putting it out there, where are you looking at for inspiration? Because I feel like you're, you're so on point all of the time. Even right now, you know, you might think you're not dressed up, but you're communicating, you know what I mean? Well, two words, Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> <laughs> are you big into tabloids? Am I what? Are you into tabloids? No, I used to read the National Enquirer, but they stopped making it. <laughs> no, wait, no, Weekly World News, not the National Enquirer, Weekly World News. That was my favorite. You know, with Bat Boy? 
Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was some great stuff. Yeah, I, I know someone who used to work for that. No, right? I don't really read the news. I don't keep up with politics. I'm just very uh, invested in Megan Mogg, and that's my entire world. Okay. And I like smoking cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just very focused on rolling cigarettes. You're quite good at it. I've had one. Yeah, I can roll a good cigarette. Uh, yeah, I get a lot of compliments about my cigarette rolling abilities. Thank you. Well, Thank with, you, Katie. With, <laughs> with such a wide skill set, what brought you to comics? You're wide, good at dressing. Wide skill set? You're great set? at rolling. How did you get, how did you make that leap from rolling cigarettes to making wildly popular comic books? Oh, it took a long time, Katie. I was at SVU. SVA. Not sports, <laughs> sports vehicle utility. <laughs> But yeah, I was telling some students at the, the SVA yesterday, I went along with Nick Gazen from Vice and did this impromptu like uh, critique of students' work. And I kept rambling about being a high school dropout and not getting anything published until I was 30. And it, it's just hard work. I've been self-publishing since I was eight years old. I worked a lot of horrible jobs, the, the, the bird shit in the aircraft hangars, like s washing all this bird shit up and McDonald's and telemarketing and... A lot of scamming the government in Australia. You can uh, very easily get $500 a fortnight every two weeks. Uh, and it's like I go in, oh, my mother's a junkie. Oh, I'm depressed. Oh, I'm sad. Oh, no. And they'd give me all this money and say, you don't have to look for work. Just take the money, hang out at home, watch Dr. Phil, draw some comics. Awesome. So for many, many years, I was just on these government benefits, just cranking comics out just obsessively. And even when I had a real job, like I worked at bookstores in London for a bunch of years, and I worked at Hat Chance, the oldest bookstore in London. A few of the Strand people, booksellers, you might know of Hat Chance in Piccadilly Circus. Bo. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, when I was working jobs, I'd be working like 13 hour days and running events at bookstores where I'd go home and stay up all night drinking Red Bull and just drawing comics obsessively for nobody but myself. It's just an intense uh, psychotic passion. And then finally I put some stuff on the internet and it, it worked out. It's, it's that simple. So all you SVA students, just, just put some stuff on the internet and it'll all work out. And you'll get invited to Russia for free and get a bunch of money and it's, it's all good. The TV networks will come knocking. It's, it's very easy. You just uh, for, forego friendships. If someone, if a friend of yours says, "Hey, it's Saturday night. Do you want to come to a party?" Say, "Fuck off." <laughs> no, I'm going to stay home and, and draw comics alone. And there you go. That's all you need to do. I co-sign that. Mm. Very nice. You forego <laughs> friendships. That's the manifesto. Alienate everybody you meet. <laughs> so uh, let's let's talk about little eight-year-old Simon uh, self-publishing. How? What were you up to then? Did you have like a copy machine? Were you printing stuff? Like how did that work? I don't know where I got the idea. I was eight years old in Tasmania. The, the local we call them news agents. Uh, it's like you know you can buy cigarettes, uh, lotto tickets, uh, juice. Uh, you know, magazines, and they had a photocopying machine, and for, I would print stuff up there. I, I made zines, I, you know, a bunch of sheets of paper and just shitty staples in the stack. No, no folding, nothing classy. <laughs> I'd sell them on the school playground. I, I don't know where I got the idea. But yeah, it was a rip-off of Mad Magazine, my first comic. It was called Spies, and it was basically just Spy versus Spy, the mad thing. I'd actually reprint some actual pages from Mad Magazine <laughs> with my versions of them. Uh, highly illegal. I was sued when I was eight years old. Um, I'm only legally allowed to talk about it now. But yeah, I just started doing that, and then I, I dropped out of high school when I was like uh, 15, because the... Uh, my principal said, you can't do this. You cannot just print your own magazine. What are you doing? And I said to him, you're a fucking dickhead. Like, there's the Riverside Gazette. Like, people locally, like, there's a local newspaper for this community, you fucking moron. Like, of course I can make a zine. And so I just dropped out of high school and uh, fuck this shit. I knew what I wanted to do. I just wanted to make comics and kept on doing it throughout hardships and bullshit and McDonald's and... And then weirdly it, it somewhat worked out and now I'm living my teenage dream and I'm still brutally depressed. <laughs> but 
That helps. <laughs> Good night. Um, well, I think, well, that's a shame because, you know, the, the drive to do something like that at such a young age should have been acknowledged and rewarded back then. It shouldn't have been squashed. Well, I grew up. Was that up, sort of the environment that you were I, coming up I grew up, up in Launceston, Tasmania, Katie. Uh, homo it was illegal to be a homosexual until 1993 in Tasmania when it was merely decriminalised. Very, very homophobic, horrible, sports-centric, cultureless, barren shithole. Um, not very supportive. My mother was a raging junkie, still is. I send her a lot of money in the post and help her out and support her. And I, I, She's a beautiful, strong woman, but afflicted by this terrible drug problem. So a lot of unemployment, a lot of drug use in Tasmania where I'm from. So yeah, I mean, no one gave a shit really. <laughs> I mean, I was just doing this stuff and no one cared. No one cared until I was like 30 when I put stuff online. I always resisted putting things online and was playing weird shirtless noise shows and <laughs> selling my work there. What was that original resistance? Original resistance? Yeah, to uh -huh. putting work online. Um, I just didn't believe in giving work away for free. I didn't believe in just... I, I still don't like web comics, really. I, I don't like that scene of just, like, tablety, meh, slopped out. I don't like computer lettering. I'm just a purist in the sense of just artisanal craft, and I paint stuff with food coloring. I just, I like getting my hands dirty. But uh, Dash Shaw's Body World kind of turned me around. In 2009, I was living in London. I saw that online, and it scrolled really well. It read really well. It was full color. I was trying to do these Megan Mog comics, and I was printing them in black and white even though I was painting them in color. I was like, fuck it, I want to work in color, but I couldn't afford to print them in color. So I was like, fuck it, I'll put stuff online, like I'll put stuff on MySpace and then later Tumblr and, and it worked out. Within one month, everyone was knocking, ooh. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been meaning to ask you, like, when did you first know that this comic was a hit? Oh, I still don't. I still f I'm still plagued by self-doubt and think I jump know. the shark. And uh, but I say that that's very healthy to hate yourself. Self-hatred is a very helpful tool in art. Constantly trying to not suck and just outdo yourself and be better. But yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, last year, like I said, I went to like ten countries. That was going to Russia and like I sold a lot of books at the Moscow Comic Con. Like I've been to SBX and TCAF and all these American things and. At first it was like a shock, like, oh, I've sold 50 books and that's like a hit? Like, that doesn't seem like many books, that's kind of shit, but, uh, yeah, in Russia it was like 300 books at Moscow Comic Con, I was like, oh, that's pretty good, and a fight broke out at one of my signings, like, this, <laughs> this goes, I must have books signed by Simon Hanselman, and my publisher's like, well, he has to go to the airport in 10 minutes and there's like 30 people in the line still, like, I'm sorry, you can't, and he's like, fuck you, I must, blah! And punches, my publisher was punching him and security was dragging them off each other and this was all in Russian and I was just trying to like, hello, how are you doing? Yes, let me sign your book and just surrounded by this Russian chaos. I mean, that, that felt all right. And on the way back from that trip, <laughs> on the way back from that trip from Poland, I'd gone from Poland to Germany and then I was about to head to Abu Dhabi and I realized I had an 18 hour layover. And I was not aware of this, and I'd already been traveling for about 15 hours, and I flipped the fuck out, and I was yelling at my agent and saying, what the fuck? How fucking dare you? You better fucking get me a hotel in Abu Dhabi. That's when I felt successful, screaming, <laughs> screaming at my agent. Just like, I just sort of like had a moment like, wow, I have an agent, and I just really fucking let her have it. And now I'm checking into this hotel room in Abu Dhabi, and they have ATMs that dispense gold bars. And I felt pretty successful. And I got some gold bars and I went to McDonald's and got some breakfast. <laughs> and that was the moment. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, well, speaking of McDonald's, uh, my favorite restaurant. Um, Katie, yes. I just got to interrupt. Please. I'm loving it. 
<laughs> Please go on. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> I, uh, I think one of my favorite moments in the new book is everybody being stoned at the McDonald's in Amsterdam and having a bad time. <laughs> and I am curious to know if that comes from personal experience. Yeah, that whole Amsterdam thread was based on my ex-girlfriend and I going to Amsterdam and forgetting a bunch of antidepressants and having a horrible, horrible fucking time. And uh, our friend decided to come as well. That's not really in the book, but our friend was like, I'm going to come to Amsterdam. And it's like, oh, you're great. You're our bipolar friend who, when they smoke any marijuana, turns into a raving fucking dickhead. Yes, you come to Amsterdam. That'll be great. <laughs> I'd love to chase you around the city looking for you behind dumpsters. Awesome. So, yeah, it was a shit time. It, yeah, I mean, the it, it reads like a nightmare, just like an absolute horrible time. Um, yeah. But I, it's, I, it's I, a wonderful comic. I don't think I pulled that off. I serialized that Amsterdam thread. Okay. It's like a 42-page comic. I was doing it like one or two pages a week on Vice. It was my first attempt at really serializing something. I, I was going to say, I don't know that I've seen that from I, you before. I did not enjoy it. Okay. I will not be doing that again. Trying to weekly make something succinct and self-contained but will also mesh into a greater whole was incredibly difficult and I, I think I kind of fucked it up. And, but people have been saying nice things and like, oh, I like the Amsterdam story. Like, Simon's flexing his muscles as a long-form storyteller. And it's like, okay, that's your opinion. I think I fucked it up, but thank you. <laughs> I, it, you know, a, a longer form story when you've been doing shorts for so long is very difficult. And I think I loved it. I mean, I would love to see more from you like that. That's nice of you to say. You got it. When I was 21, I started a 1,000-page uh, graphic novel, which was a stupid idea. What are you, Dave Sim? I got a quarter of the way through. I'm not Dave Sim. Um, I'm not a misogynist. <laughs> and I, I will not be handing out forms that... If you heard about Dave Sim, he makes people sign a form that says, I am not a misogynist. The you guy did you Cerebus. Have fax, you have to fax it to him. You know, Cerebus, anyway, he's a weird, <laughs> he's a weird crackpot in, in comics. He believes that women do not possess a certain light. Men have a certain light in their brain that women do not have. I, did, I used to do a thing called Truth Zone with the Megan Mog characters. It was about comics criticism. You know it, you're nodding. Anyway, I did a Dave Sim episode, and Meg said in it, I really want to punch his fucking lights out. I thought that was a clever line, because I was like, yeah, I'm taking your lights thing, and like, yeah, yeah. take that, Dave Sim, you misogynistic piece of shit. So you started a thousand-page comic. Uh, yeah, bad idea. You <laughs> what, what happened there? Um, I got a quarter of the way through it. The draw, I did draw it over seven years, 21 through 28. No, it's not, Grant. It's horrible. It sucks. I'll pillage it for ideas for Megan Mog. That'll do. But, you know, it's, it, I was young. I was silly. The, I drew it over seven years. The, the drawing dramatically changed. It, it was unfocused. It was... I, I decided to jigsaw everything together. I was drawing autobio comics. I was drawing dream comics. I was drawing made-up comics. I was drawing weird, bad teenage poetry comics. I jigsawed it all together and like, yes, I'm 21. I'm going to do this big thing. I'm going to get published. It's going to be amazing and massive failure. Young artists should really stick to short stories and just sort of test the waters and fuck around and, until you commit. Uh, I'm still scared. I want to do this big uh, Meg's Coven. Uh, Megan Mog book, uh, like 400 pages, and I'm scared. I see these young artists getting like uh, deals with first, second, and stuff. Like, I'm doing a 400 page book about this, and it's like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> That's gonna be pretty good, yeah. I mean, maybe it'll be great. Maybe they're a fucking genius, but when I was 21, my work was pretty unformed. And it takes a long time. Comics is a, a difficult thing, you're doing it alone. Mm -hmm. You're the writer, you're the director, you're the artist, you're, you're everything. It's, it's, it's a tough racket. It's, it's hard to do. Yeah, and I think at that age when you've only had so much life experience, it's like what can you even really bring to a comic that exactly. long? And I think, I think something that I've seen in, in your work is the more you've lived and the more you've kind of gone out in the world with it, the more you're putting back into it. See, I was lucky in that I was diddled as a child. <laughs> I mean, you know, I had a junkie mother, I was molested, I starred in a prison sex video, video when I was five. I've lived a lot. I've done a lot of things. So, you know, it's all good material. Um, I recommend getting molested as a child. 
<laughs> no, I'm sorry, but I was. But I don't let it haunt me. I, you know, I don't, I don't let that shit fuck me up. I had a fucked up upbringing in a fucked up town, living around a lot of fucked up, desperate people. But I haven't let that fuck me up, and it's just all grist for the mill. It's all material. I'm, I'm glad I didn't grow up, you know, well off and you know, rich with a well adjusted family I that what the fuck would I write about I, I can't make things up I just have to base things on my disgusting experiences sure uh, have you found the process of working to be cathartic or therapeutic at all or oh, do you think yeah, it's something right. separate you, you, you I know what you're doing what now you, you were saying you read my interviews I'm always banging on about oh art therapy blah 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 <laughs> so you're just like prompting me so I can uh, yeah I, I, I see behind the curtain <laughs> But yeah, no, comics is very therapeutic for me, as I imagine it is for most cartoonists. It's, it's your private world. It's, it's my private Idaho. It's, it's where I go to escape. Everything just disappears and melts away when I'm working. When I've been drawing for 10 hours, it's just, it's just me and what I'm doing. It's selfish in a beautiful way. It's just enveloping yourself in this world. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's a lot of demons floating around, poking me in the butt with their pitchforks, and yeah, it's nice to get away from that shit, and and it's a distancing as well, like uh, this Meg's Coven book I keep talking about and kind of started a few years ago, but it's all about my mother's drug abuse and my schizophrenic grandmother and, you know, this fucked up shit, but I'm just putting Meg in that position, and it helps me to deal with it. If, if I can turn it into fiction and kind of look at it from afar, and, and turn it into this comedic farce that helps me to deal with this like shit that I'm dealing with. Cause like my mom's fucked. I, she's going in and out of rehab constantly. And you know, I, I gave her thousands of dollars last year. And then she told me at Christmas, oh, I just spent it all on drugs. I just shot it up my arm. And it's like, well that sucks. That was for food and bills. What the fuck are you doing? You idiot. But you know, it's drug addiction. It's uh, anyway. Well, how are things going in Seattle? Seattle is good. I moved to Seattle in January. Uh, my wife lives there, my beautiful wife. Um, it's nice. I, I'm experiencing a form of domestic bliss. Yeah, I have a dog, a beautiful dog called Bubbin. Uh, Wanda, but we, I call her Bubbin. And how many the rabbits? Bourbon. I know there's a lot of rabbits. And, and some rabbits. We also have four rabbits. Yeah, we have a nice house. We just bought a car together and I feel adult and I, 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 I like being in love. I've, I've been in several long-term relationships, but this is the first time I've really felt warmly in love and... We're both crazy people, but we just, our craziness just meshes together and yeah, it's nice. I like Seattle. I don't leave the house much because I'm a workaholic, so the rain is fine. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's good. Fanny yeah, Graphics is there. I'm a publisher yeah. of Fanny Graphics. <laughs> the dirty old office. <laughs> uh, Grant and I had a meeting. Uh, Grant, my friend Grant is here actually my flowers. We had to like have this like weird meeting with like a lawyer we had to talk to gary groth the publisher of fanographics and uh talk to lawyers on the phone and grant was really distracted the whole time by these filthy paper plates in the corner of gary's office just like they'd been we found out later they were boobins they were the dogs and she'd like licked through the plates but we were like what is gary doing in here is he like <laughs> licking through these paper plates like just and there's dogs in the office running around like it's People talk about fanographics like, oh, they're this big corporation. Like, uh, it's like, no, it's a punk house. It's like, a house with like four people in it. Right? <laughs> it's a shithole. Like, <laughs> it smells. But yeah, no, it's lovely. Seattle's great. There's a decent comic scene, and not that I care because I don't leave the house. <laughs> when I was in Melbourne, like Melbourne has the best fucking comic scene right now. Like we really we're punching internationally. Like you know, fuck New York, fuck Berlin, fuck all these international hotspots, fuck Toronto, <laughs> fuck off. Yeah, fuck them. But yeah, Melbourne's really good, but I still never left the house. I never went and visited Michael Hawkins. I never visited Tommy Parrish. I was like, eh, I got work to do. But uh, I'm a loner. Mm -hmm. I like being at home. I like watching my veep and just <laughs> patting the dog and rolling my cigarettes. It sounds like a good deal. And I, I, it sounds like the stabilization has helped the productivity. No. Well, not no? so. Well, when I was in Melbourne, I was a disgusting bachelor. I'd work for 30 hours non-stop, and I'd get this automatic drawing happening where things were just flying out. So you draw for 30 hours non-stop, and, 
And I just eat 7-Eleven hot dogs and I never saw daylight. But now I'm attempting to be a present spouse. I'm attempting to be there for somebody and, and make myself available. So I, I am, you know, ex- I, less intense work hours and, you know, I'm having to stop and start and kind of... But, you know, I've still, I've still gotten a lot of work done. My, my bandmate, I mentioned earlier, a bunch of friends have been dying. My fucking bandmate of 10 years died. And then two weeks later, my art dealer and publisher died. And so what am I going to do? I'm just going to work. I'm just, you know, I could sit here weeping all day or, or I'll just, like, weep while I work. So I, I, I have gotten a decent amount of stuff done this year. Because that's, that's how I measure my worth as a human organism, as a, as a flesh sack. I, you know, it's what work I get done. It's very unhealthy. There's a whole self-care movement right now, which I don't care for. <laughs> people are like, oh, we're going to look after ourselves. And oh, people at art school are like, oh, pressured to work all night. It's like, good. Okay. Fucking good. Like... And my mother worked three fucking jobs raising me. This, you know, fucked up, depressed junkie who'd been in intensely fucked up in her childhood. And she worked really hard to support me. If she'd been like, well, I just need some self-care. I kind of like, Simon, we're not going to eat this week. Like, you know, we, we don't have a house now because I need to do some self-care. Like, fuck off. Uh, you know, if you want to succeed, you need to work hard. You know, that's the only secret to, like, making it in film or comics. You just have to work fucking relentlessly hard. If your health goes a bit by the wayside, well, them's the breaks. (laughs) Yeah, woo, thank you. (laughs) Fuck (laughs) self-care. Uh, <laughs> okay. Get off Twitter as well. If I look at your Twitter and you've got 30,000 tweets and you haven't drawn a comic in six months, you're not a cartoonist. You can just fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all fair. Get off the internet, seriously. Like, I'm on the internet a bit, but come on. Like, enough's enough. Like, you got to get work done. Do you, do you feel like your relation? I mean, it sounds like you've always felt that way. Do you feel like now that you, you know, your work is, is out there and you're sort of recognizable, like that relationship has changed or you're just kind of like, fuck it, you don't care? I, in regards to what, what don't I care Anything, about? Anything, like social media, the, the I, way you present I, yourself? I was trying to play ball a few years ago with all these self-care kind of PC people and now I'm just, I'm sick of it. It just seems like a culture of just breeding softness and just not getting anything done and just complaining about things and being upset by things. And I, I don't think it's culturally really helpful. I think, yeah, be a, be a good person and be respectful of people, but don't let it cripple you to the point where you can't have a conversation with someone without getting upset. Yeah. And at, at this point, yeah, I'm just, you know, I, I, I try to get my work done. I'm trying to support my family. I, I'm trying to support my fucking sick mother. Yeah, I'm an ableist bastard. Fuck you, you chronically ill piece of shit. <laughs> there, I said it. <laughs> but no, my, my best friend Grant does have a chronic illness and he works fucking hard. You have to. Yeah. Your mum's sick as well. She's done she worked so hard for you. She moved to Australia and got you there and did so much for you. <laughs> You should have chilled out, just die young death, and just take it easy. Yeah, you could have died when you were two years old. She could have just stayed in Chicago and just let you die. Yeah, she should have. She should have. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm turning into a real asshole. I, you know, I, I, I made a lot of money last year, and now I'm just turning into a real conceited piece of shit. I'm a real asshole. <laughs> well, I think I think you bring up a good point in that, which is that I think, you know, even like 10 years ago, like artists didn't have this pressure to maintain a personality and a business and like a persona and all this stuff online versus now you have to and you have to toe a certain line and you kind of have to watch what you say. Um, And that seems like something that you're kind of just saying fuck it to. It's PC gone mad. Well, I don't even know that it's PC. (laughs) I think it's, it's this idea of like branding. Do you know what I mean? Like, doesn't that word make you sick? Branding? Like, personal branding? Yeah, but you have to. You do? You do. If you, you, you have to be a triple threat. You've got to get the work done. You've got to be good at doing business emails. And you've got to do fucking branding. It's disgusting. It's, it's sick. But you have to do it. Uh, you've got to just jump into the machine and do what you can. The only people that succeed in any art forms, really, are assholes. That's just, you have to be a cutthroat asshole. I don't know. 
I think that's fair. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a tough racket, the funny books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of all the rackets, it's the most underpaid and like underappreciated and just shat upon art form. We're gaining some traction. I'm sitting in the Strand right now. I could just be at smelly old desert island in Brooklyn, but I'm here at the Strand. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> We have microphones. We have technology behind this. We, we do. It's, but the numbers are down. Like Dan Klaus, Pete Bag were selling like 20,000 units of their floppies, as they're now referred to. You know, their pamphlets. I, I think before the internet, people were hungry for content in a different way, and were going to alternative record stores and weird places and buying shit. But now that we have this instant gratification, blah, 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 internet thing, people are buying less material, printed material. But that just makes sense. People have iPads now. There's Comixology. You can get shit online. People expect shit for free. The day my books come out, the next day they're on fucking Pirate Bay. Someone scanned them, which I don't give a shit about. Go for it. But everything's changing, and we're selling less books, even though comics are in bookstores now, and a kind of, you know, the Paris Review has comics in there and stuff. It, it's still pretty shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, given all of that, what uh, what do you see coming down the pike for Meg and Mog? And for Al? Meg and Mog, mm -hmm. we are stopped just ranting Meg, and Meg, maybe talk about Meg and well, Mog. Well, we have oh, we ableism have junkies. Oh. <laughs> Meg and Mark, just I, I, next week, I, in between TCAF and line work, I have to do the cover for the next Meg and Mark book. I already, I'm already 150 pages into the next Meg and Mark book. Uh, just put out a new mini comic. Got TV executives like, you know, I'm trying to do that. I got my, my, my lawyer, my Mick Jagger lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Mick Jagger lawyer? I, used to, I have the same entertainment lawyer as Mick Jagger, Frank Miller, and Todd McFarlane, which is very weird. Um, that is your ilk, if yeah. I've ever heard. Oh, yeah, they're my guys. So we were all hanging out at Union Pool before Frank came around, and Todd was there, and like, oh, boy, Spawn, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Mick Jagger strutted on by. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm just working very hard still and just, I mean, I want to do other things. Uh, does anyone know Knut Hampson? This refers back to your question about what do I like reading and stuff. My favorite author is Knut Hampson, a Norwegian writer from like the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, who unfortunately went senile in the 1930s and became a Nazi sympathizer and actually gave his Nobel Prize to Joseph Goebbels. Um, <laughs> And he was the shame of Norway for many, many years. <laughs> but recently they've said, like, okay, he became a disgusting, senile racist, but he is a beautiful prose writer. And he really did invent this new type of psychological fiction. Um, but yeah, I, 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 for years, like 10 years, I've wanted to do this adaptation of this, uh, this uh, book, Mysteries, of his. But if I did that, you know, everyone goes to the comic shop, oh, the new Simon Hanselman book's out, fuck yeah, more rimming cats and more bong jokes. And they're like, oh, what's this? this is like romantic literary fiction from the turn of the century. What the fuck is this? I, I feel like I'm stuck with Megan Mog now, but I also love that and I actively dislike drawing anything that is not a witch or a cat. I'm very comfortable with Meg and Mog. I, I know them. Uh, Grant and I were trying to write like a pitch for like fucking Nickelodeon a few years ago and I just, I hated these characters. I just, I'd forced myself to make them up. Meg and Mog came naturally and organically and just somehow works for me and I find them very versatile. So I'm sticking with them. The, the, the next five or 10 years will just be all Meg and Mog. And then maybe, maybe if I make enough money, then I'll drop all this weird shit that no one will like. <laughs> like I want to get in the Dan Klaus position. He spent five years on patience. You know, he just got to tinker with it, fuck around. That's what I want. I, I don't want to be rushing out weekly comics for Vice and trying to do these other things and having all... Uh, it's, it's, it's too much. The last few months have been very stressful trying to get all this shit done and before I came on this trip I was like trying to get ahead a few weeks on Vice so I could like enjoy myself at festivals and, yeah. and this, but then as soon as I get home I just got to start again. I've got three foreign edition covers to do. I got a four page strip for the Fantagraphics 40th anniversary book. I got to do this Mirror Mirror anthology that Julia and Sean are doing. Mirror Mirror from 2D Cloud. You guys got fucking Clive Barker for that. That's, that's quite a good 2D Cloud. 2D Cloud. 2D Cloud. I think Jake Terrell's in the audience. 2D Cloud affiliate. 
Jake Terrell, he designed the he designed the sets for Hotline Bling. He did. He Jake Terrell did the sets for the Drake Hotline Bling video. Uh, it's not a joke. It's not a joke. Yeah, the Jake Terrell's a great New York cartoonist, uh, but yeah, 2D Cloud. Also, these boys over here. Did you bring that book for me, Max? Max, I'm sorry. Nice. Yeah, SVA, SVA. When I did the critique, uh, Max and Andrew were here. They were, they were the, the find at SVA. Grant and I were like, oh, there's a lot of bad work here. Like, oh, there's a lot of people doing airbrush concept work on, on the tablets. Steven Universe. Hashtag Steven Universe. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we, there were these guys there that actually put together a beautiful book. It was really well curated and really great. And I'm rambling, Katie. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, that's it's what, nice. That's to what we're here for. It's nice to discover new, fresh talent and feel excited by something. Yeah, and absolutely. Because I like. Ba, 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 Max Huffman. <laughs> but yeah, I've been to a lot of comic shops around the world. I've done, I went 10 countries last year. Russia, Poland, Spain, blah, blah, blah. I've seen a lot of comics, a lot of comic shops. It's hard to impress me these days. <laughs> I'm, you know, very uppity and very arrogant and a real, just, my eyes are so jaded. I understand. But yeah, you guys, you guys impressed me. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, dem I demanded that they come here and sell me this book. They're like, we only have this student copy to show to art directors. And I was like, well, you better fucking come and bring me one. I'll, I'll give you $40 for it. Like, come on. And they have. Beautiful boys. Beautiful boys. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think that's a nice place maybe to start taking some questions from the Yeah, beautiful the boys. The let's just keep that in your mind. That's, that's, that's my last words. I want hear. that on my, on my tombstone. Beautiful boys. <laughs> So if you want to raise your hand, I'll bring you a mic and ask a question. Sound good? Anybody? I will answer anything. Dig deep. Go dark. Well, I have to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, you, didn't you, did you listen to the talk? Did, did you listen? <laughs> yeah, you don't count. You're not a real question asker. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And okay. Hey, Simon. Um, hey, how you doing? Good. Uh, you, your work is... Um, I like your say? jacket. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've laughed as hard as I have like when I read your stuff. So I wonder, if, like, when you write it, does it crack you up? Because, I mean, it, it's like, it, I, you know, I... The, both of your books, you know, I've read, like, you know, you read them in a couple, you know, an hour or two, and I just, you know, found it, I don't know. It's like like a real deep laughter in my gut, which is like... Oh, thank you, sir. I don't know. It, it, I guess not so much a question is more of a compliment. Um, but no, but you, no you did technically ask a question if I laugh at my yeah, own work, yeah. if I arrogantly sit around laughing yeah. at my own work because, with, I mean, with a shit-eating grin on my face and a smug look thinking like, wow, I'm terrific. <laughs> this one's going to really make him laugh in the aisles. Um, but I do. I, I do. Um... The, the, the smuggest, most shit-eating grin when I'm working. But no, no I do. I, I laugh at my own shit, you know what I mean? That's the test. The Simpsons, I listen to a lot of Simpsons writers' commentaries, and they do say that, like, they hear the jokes so many times, the ones they keep in are the ones that they've laughed at, like, 30 times, and it's still funny. So I attempt to keep in the good ones and cut the shit out, but uh, I do rush a lot of my work. I mean, with deadlines, you've got to rush this stuff, but... Uh, I, I am sitting around laughing sometimes. I, I get a bit stoned. It's legal to get stoned in Seattle, so I don't even feel bad saying that. Fuck you, New York police. It's legal in Seattle. You should legalize it everywhere. It's good for my friend Grant. He has a chronic illness. He needs... It makes him feel less depressed. I smuggle weed into this fucking city. Fuck you all. Yeah. To quote the strokes, New York City cops, they ain't too smart. I'm going to get arrested after this. Thank you. But yeah, I'm always laughing at my own jokes. I'm a real prick. <laughs> I'm glad you like it, though. Was Amsterdam okay? I was worried it was not good. I don't know. I keep worrying about jumping the shark. Like, this thing's going to lose its magic. Whatever magic there is there, luckily for me. But we'll see how it goes. Diesel and Jackson? Yeah. 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 Okay. There'll be more of Diesel and Jackson. Werewolf Jones' horrible children. He has more children as well. He has around seven children. There's the. <laughs> you have not seen the baby in the birdcage. 
I can't wait. Do we have another question? Yeah, a quick plug while the microphone is being delivered to that gentleman. There is Werewolf Jones and Sons issue two coming out soon. It will be available online. We promised it for TCAF, but we fucked up. <laughs> um, I'm sick, fuck you. Yeah, he's got a chronic illness. You ableist bastards. If anyone complains at TCAF, like, oh my, how dare you? Let's do it. Uh, you, you just said, like, I wasn't so sure Amsterdam was good. Does it ever take, like, fan reaction to convince you what you did is worth anything? Yeah, it kind of does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think all my work shit. Like I was saying earlier as well, like, I, I think it's healthy to hate yourself and think your stuff shit. Like, uh, just a certain level of criticism and, like, is this good? Could I be doing better? See, I'm always worried that it's not good. And I get really high, so it's like, eh, is, this, is, this, is this good or am I just high? Like, what's going on? But yeah, it's been comforting to read reviews where people are saying this works and this long-form story worked, this serialized thing. It's, it's, it's pleasant and it, it makes me feel warm inside. Are there ever comics where you're like, I was too high? Yeah, the, put this the, one out? there's certain episodes that have been cut from both both books and I'm like maybe I could put this in and, and it's some stuff that I put on Vice or in the books where it's like it works like f it functions as a piece of something but it's just not quite right it's not that funny or it's not that good or but it works it's good enough to put out there but just mm, middling <laughs> mediocre and uh, it's sad when you know that when you maybe you still put it out there and you have to uh, but like this week on Vice, this Wednesday's Vice Weekly, because I do a weekly comic on Vice. Uh, I, yeah, the segue, I, I was like, oh, people are going to hate this. But then it got a bunch of comments more than usual, and people really liked it. So, eh. you know, who knows? It's all in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe on that side of the room? I can see a hand nice over there. Trick. That uh, flower-headed girl over there. She's got flowers on her face. Really? <laughs> nice. She's been vetted by my crew. <laughs> um, hey. Hi. Hi. My question is, how do you keep from being shy when you're writing really fucked up stuff? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I am a shy person. I, I do get quite uptight and weird, but I, I played in bands for like 10 years. And uh, a lot of substance abuse. Hot tip for shy people. <laughs> substance abuse. Um, being really drunk really helps. Uh, you know, I'm a bit tipsy right now. I was a bit nervous about coming here. I was like, oh, I'm going to fuck this up. and I'm going to be late. And I don't have time to get dressed up. Fuck. And I, I got to talk about myself again. But I, I don't know. It's just, you have to try and detach from reality. <laughs> yeah, I seem to do okay with it. I... I don't know. And you've got to dazzle people as well. I'm always saying that. You've got to dazzle them. You can't just be like, Hi, I'm a cartoonist. Hi, I'm Chris Ware. How are you doing? <laughs> like, but I mean, Chris Ware's an amazing artist. He can let the work speak for itself. Like, you know, I, I feel that I have to overcompensate by being a gregarious uh, grum uh, douchebag. Just, just a ranty, Oh, mum's a junkie. Oh, drugs, blah, blah, blah. Woo! I, I don't know. But I just feel you have to do that a bit. I feel really weird about my cross-dressing getting eaten up by publicity. Like, I, I, I feel like I have to do that now, and it's taking a very personal, private thing that I still feel very shy about. I don't like going dressed up out on the streets. I get laughed at by children. I get yelled at by horrible dude bros. I hear stories from friends that are getting you, you know, beaten up, or you know, hear about murders, like trans people getting murdered. So. I very much rely on my white male privilege. <laughs> um, sometimes, I mean, I have it, so I, I use that and I can blend in. And but yeah, I get really nervous uh, when I, I dress up and I'm on the trains and people are looking at me and I, I worry that I'm going to get beaten to death. Uh, I've gotten slightly off topic, but anyway. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's weird, the cross-dressing getting, getting mixed in with the publicity shit. I kind of regret that happening. I wish it was just a private thing. But uh, it, uh, it's weird how it's morphed. Like, it was killing me a few years ago. I was just so fucking depressed about... I had no outlet. I, my, my girlfriend hated my cross-dressing and was really weirdly homophobic about it. And 
Ah, uh, yeah, but it's, then I had this big public explosion, and, and now it feels less urgent, and I, I don't need to do it as much, and, but now I'm forced to do it when I do public appearances. Uh, you know, I'll do it at home. I mean, you know, regularly at home, I'm just, you know, casually dressing up or wear a skirt around the house or whatever, but... Yeah, to get all doled up and go out on the subway, that's pretty scary. I really admire people that are just fucking out there, just like, I don't give a fuck, and just fucking doing it. Devil may care. Because I am kind of shy sometimes and reserved, and it's hard for me to do that. I feel like a failure today, because I'm like, oh, I didn't do it. No, everyone wanted me to. But yeah, fuck it. Fuck everyone. <laughs> <laughs> fuck it. Yeah. Any more questions? That was a bit of a tangent. A, up here. No. Man, a blind spot. I was to ask a question about how you guys know each other and like why you decided to do this together and how you met. And well, through comics. I mean, Katie's just cool. She's a good cartoonist and she's a good critic and stuff. She writes a lot of good critical essays and, you know... I'm starting to do that more now. I, yeah. I'm trying to. There's a lot of, of good work coming out that I think deserves thank you very much initially i think like there was we wanted to get someone crazy to do this like let's ask macaulay colkin to interview me at the strand and he was like well i don't know who the fuck this guy is and i have a speaking fee so no <laughs> it's like let's get like molly soda or something like that's outside the box but then I was just like, fuck it. Let's just get fucking Katie I'm Skelly. I'm just cheap She's and easy, and that's been the yeah. name of my game Let's get Katie Skelly. Forever. She's cheap and easy. And that's... that's <laughs> but uh, but I, I first came across your work on Tumblr, which is like just where I see stuff now. Um, I, like I, I'm like you. I hate leaving the house. And I live here. And so, you know, my life is just train to work, train home. Um, so I, even though I love The Strand, and I love Desert Island, and I love all the wonderful shops we have here, I, like, don't leave the house. So... Uh, I saw your work and I saw Truth Zone and I was like, my God, this is so fucking hilarious. And it was it was like inside baseball a little bit because it was a lot of cartoonist sort of humor. Too much so. Well, but I was I was reading and I was like, this is so funny, so funny. When is Simon gonna do me? When am I gonna be on? And I would just scroll, scroll, scroll and I was like, I guess I'm just not, just not vice enough or whatever, but I never made it on there. Yeah. But maybe one day. But I mean, now that I, now I've talked about it, so now it's passe. <laughs> so. My wife is still bitter. The, my, my wife is <laughs> the publicist at Fanagraphics and she's very bitter that uh, like the event booker from Fanagraphics made it into a truth zone but, <laughs> but, my, but my wife didn't I, I, th she was on a list I, I keep telling her you were on my list I had to quit truth zone because I had to take the paying job at Vice that seems like the wise yeah move. truth zone yeah. paid nothing very mm -hmm. fun but it paid nothing right. I, I needed to eat and you know not sleep in a dumpster so I, I took the vice gig. I think that, I mean, obviously, you know, getting money, get money over everything, right? Um, but I also think that there's a, a smart move about that because, you know, you don't want to stay, I think a lot of cartoonists tend to, tend to stay very insular. And I think they play to the crowd, which is other cartoonists. So you have managed to do something that reaches a broad audience while still being a cartoonist cartoonist. And that's kind of amazing. Yeah, that is, I'm an anomaly, I guess, within comics. I, I'm very surprised, like, that Megan Morgan Amsterdam when it's like today I just my publicist messaged me oh week three on the New York Times bestseller list you're still on there and it's just like shit okay I didn't think this book would, I didn't think Amsterdam would make it on I thought I lucked out with Mega Hex and this one I'm like eh but yeah no it's weird like it's weird to go to Russia and have people fighting over you it's 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 <laughs> it's, it's really fucking weird I just added another thing to my list of goals though so thank you Russia. for sharing it was no beautiful, people though. Russians fighting over me it was very scary it could be about though. comics or not I got on the plane to leave Russia and it was just like, oh my God, thank fuck, I survived. <laughs> we drove 16 hours from St. Petersburg to Moscow and my publisher said, like, police, they may pull us over and shoot us in back of head execution style in the woods and barriers. They do that, it's common. It's like, what are you fucking doing? And they're slamming down vodka while they're driving. And we were driving a big white van with the Ghostbusters symbol on the side. <laughs> So it's like, could we be any more obvious? <laughs> oh, God, it was fucking scary. But the food was amazing. Kazakh food is incredible. And it was, it was a beautiful country. I, I did Russian karaoke and saw a bunch of my publishers like, Grom control to Mejitu. You're hot and you're cold. You're yes and you're no. <laughs> it, was, it was a good time. Yeah, fuck. Do we want to take one more? Yeah, we got time for one more. Got time for one more. 
and then I'll start doodling in books. Our uh, signing jail, as I call it, table jail. <laughs> I've got one, actually. Nobody else does. Um, naked mog or hairless mog in hot shave. Uh, oh, is that yeah. Colonel Sanders? It looked like Colonel Sanders to me. No, it was Sorry actually based on Vince Gilligan, the creator of Breaking oh. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. No, I didn't intend that, but fuck, that looks like Vince Gilligan. Yeah. You think Colonel Sanders, uh, the same oh, facial hair. I, mean, but I thought at first, but I can see it. It's like there's, there's one Meg in Mega Hex that looks exactly like Chloe Sevigny. And there's a mog that looks exactly like Matthew Perry. Sometimes just a, <laughs> I gotta go just, find you know, a little light flick of the hand. Right, so everybody go look for those. Yeah, it's a fun game. It's like finding Waldo. Can you find the Chloe Seven named Meg in Murder Hooks? <laughs> Rainy day fun. All right, well, yeah. if nobody has any more questions, I think it's time for signing jail, as you said. Yeah, let's get on the table, Sounds jail. Nice you. Thank you. Thank well, you all thank so much. Thank you to much. Kelly, and thank you so much to Simon. Thank you for coming. Thank you to The Strand for having me.